Welcome to What is Next, your favorite educative interactive program on GTV, the authentic and the trusted voice of Ghana. This afternoon, we want to consider a very important part of our national life, the issue about human rights, issues about human dignity, women issues issues that affect all of us and I'm very happy that we are blessed to have somebody who has dedicated her life to issues about human rights, women rights, children rights and betterment of society. I'm in conversation this afternoon with the managing consultant of APES Law Consult. She is a human rights consultant and she's been there for women. Mrs. Sheila Menka Premo, welcome to What is Next. Thank you very much, Reverend. We are very grateful that you have accepted to be with us. For my viewers to appreciate the lady behind the name Sheila Menka Premo, will you share with us briefly? some of the values that has shaped you. Who is Mrs. Sheila Minka Bravo? Thank you very much, Reverend. I am also honored to be here mm -hmm. to participate in this very important program. I was brought up in a mission house because I grew up with my grandparents. And there were lots of values that I learned from them which have actually shaped my life. The value of integrity, the value of being satisfied with what you have, not being covetous of what others have, serving others with whatever you have. That's one of the things that was also drummed into me. Being kind to others, being patient. You know, most of the Christian values that you see in the Bible, they try to imbibe it in us. And um, so I try to, as much as possible, live my life in accordance with those values and principles. Mm. And those have shaped my life a lot, mm. particularly the value of service, which is using whatever you have to serve others, to serve mankind. So with my training as a lawyer, very early in my life as a lawyer, yes, I trained as a lawyer. And usually when you finish law school, the expectation is that it's you know working, making a lot of money for yourself, etc. I did work, I did start practice in a law firm, but in the same year that I was called to the bar, I was invited by an association of women lawyers. In those days, Peter Ghana, they had a legal aid program. And they invited the few of us who were called to the bar, the few women lawyers who had been called to the bar. We were about 10 out of 60 people who had been called to the bar. You're talking about how many years? No. This was in 1989, so 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. They invited us to a tea party in October 1989 to tell us what they do. And they reinforced some of the values that had been taught to me by my grandparents, which is using your skills also to help others, particularly vulnerable women and children. So I recall that after that meeting in October mm, 1989, you know, I just started volunteering. I, would, I was doing my, my, my working in a law firm, but volunteering regularly at the FIDA Legal Aid Center. And I must say that the period that I served a lot of indigenous women and children, it's, if I look back, it was one of the most satisfying periods of my life. And it has also indirectly benefited me a lot in mm. several ways, mm. you know, based on the work that I had done serving women and children, you know, running up and down the courts, helping them, helping settle um, problems relating to marriages, childcare issues, paternity issues, etc. I got the chance to get a scholarship, just purely based on that work I had done on a voluntary basis, because I loved to help as much as I could. Um, in around about 1993, 94, there was a USAID scholarship, which was looking out for women lawyers who were already doing work helping women and children. So I immediately qualified for that scholarship to go and do a master's in law, to at least learn about some of the theories relating to the areas in which I was working, which is human rights and, and policy issues relating to women. 
So that also added on to my, um, it, it enhanced my skills after the, 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 the master's program, LLM in law. I worked with a policy organization in Washington, D.C. for six months. You know, also seeing how American women are also using their laws, et cetera, to help indigent people. And it's also influenced my life a lot. So after that program, I came back working, but then I, I guess I joined a lot of other groups to do more um, advocacy, to see, to ensuring that we had laws in place that would help women, you know, policy, looking more at policy, still doing some of the services, but doing more of policy type work, trying to identify gaps in our law and joining others to advocate for the enactment of laws to um, better protect particularly women and children. Mm. Are there certain individuals that you will want to consider as mentors, people whose either their books, their advices, their example, have made significant influence on your life? Yes, so I, 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 I must say quite a number of people but I always say that I'll start off with my own grandmother, Mrs. Violet Upukwa Akufu. She taught me a lot of the values. She also showed by example, you know, as a child, I would follow her to various women programs and she would talk and she would help, you know, in many ways. So for me, she's one of my role models. And she also taught me that um, whatever a man can do, a woman can also do it as well. So I was given a lot of opportunities whilst living with her. Then one of the women lawyers that really helped me and then influenced me a lot was um, Justice uh, or Judge Professor Kwea Kwenye here. At the time I joined FIDA Ghana, she was one of the women who opened up a lot of opportunities for me. You know, I learned a lot about, um, a lot more of the policy and international perspectives about things. I always remember her, the very first international conference I attended which was in 1991 in Tanzania, in Arusha. She had been invited to go and make a presentation at a conference which was being chaired by Nyerere in those days. And she asked me to go and represent her, you know. So she was one of my mentors and I learned a lot from her. There were also other women at FIDA in those days, Mrs. Miss Emilia Japon, um, Auntie Marianne Addo, quite a number of them really, really, really helped me a lot. And then my very own aunt, who is the current Chief Justice of Ghana, she's um, a relative of mine, my mother's sister. I, she's somebody who I also knew from childhood. And I lived you know, a bit with her as a growing um, teenager. I also learned a lot of things from her, a lot of hard work. And so she's somebody who also I look up to a lot and I've learned a lot from. I'm sure that if I said I'm, I'm going to come from mm -hmm. the list, it would be a long list. There's Mrs. Henrietta Mensa, Professor um, Henrietta Mensa Bonsu. Mm -hmm. As a, a young student, you know, she's somebody who really encouraged me. I mean, she saw that I tried to be as hardworking as I could, and she really, she would call me and encourage me. She saw I had a few challenges in those days. So she's somebody who, when I think back on my life on campus, she's somebody who also really um, reached out to me and helped to encourage me a lot. At the, when I finished um, University of Ghana, when I finished, when I qualified as a lawyer, I went back to campus to be a teaching assistant for a year. And I worked um, closely with her and she also encouraged me a lot. And then um, Professor Fusuama, um, he was also a, the dean of the faculty of law when I was a student, also encouraged me a lot. So for those two people, I mean, and, uh, incidentally, when I was a teaching assistant, I was a teaching assistant for both contracts and then taught in criminal law. These were subjects that they were um, responsible for. So I think that's, you know, mm. there's several people, several, several people, but these are some of the ones that I can immediately think of, and I, I owe a lot to them for what I am today, I would say. You've been a very strong voice on human rights issues, women issues. Would you help my viewers to appreciate when it comes to human rights issue? How do you describe this country? Where are we? Are we doing well? What I would say is that on the books, we have a lot of um, good laws and legislation, starting off with our constitution. Um, our 1992 constitution has very strong provisions on fundamental human rights in chapter 5. You can see it from article 12 to about 33. 
It protects the right to life. It protects um, so many, so many protections. Some of the key, I mean, it, it, it ensures that there should be no discrimination on the basis of, of basis of gender and race and other things. At the same time, it also makes provision in Article 17.4 to say that even though there's not, we, we are not supposed to have laws which are discriminatory against one particular gender. If it is found that historically one particular gender has been discriminated against in certain areas, there's nothing wrong if Parliament comes up with a law to ensure that the, the, the wrong is righted. We have provisions on property rights of spouses in Article 22, which are also very key to ensure that there should be equity for properties which are jointly acquired in the course of a marriage. There are provisions on children's rights in Article 28, which are also very key. It talks about the child's right to be with parents, but, and if not, you know, ways in which children should be protected. We have some provisions also on, on women's rights. So there are several important provisions in our constitution that if we, we really ensure that they are enforced. It'd be very important. Another one, which is one of my favorites, which I haven't mentioned, is in Article 26. Article 26 protects the right to religion or to practice culture, etc. But it indicates that any cultural or religious practice which is injurious or causes, you know, which causes injury or is inhuman, it is prohibited. So based on that, a lot of um, women's rights activists have stood on that to ensure that some of the practices that we have, at least customary practices that we have, which are injurious, have been criminalized. In our criminal law, we have a lot of legislation which have been passed over the, which have been um, introduced over the years to criminalize some harmful cultural practices. I'm sure you've heard of the practice of what we call istropusi, which is um, ritual servitude. There are some parts of Ghana where they have this traditional practice where if somebody is dying in the family and they go to see some fetish priest, they would ask for a young girl to be brought to the shrine for life to appease for the sins of the family. Lots of girls are sent there, and that's the end of their lives. Basically, they don't have, a, they don't go to, they don't go to school. Some of them get raped. And when they have children, you know, they have so many problems. So there's a law prohibiting that. I'm sure you've also heard of females um, genital mutilation. There are also laws protecting that. Even widowhood rights. One of the rights that we all go through in Ghana, we have various widowhood rights that we go through. But uh, there's a provision which was introduced into our criminal law to say that. If any widowhood right causes injury to a person, and this is in line with Article 26 of the Constitution, then it is an offence, and you can actually report it. We have um, a law on domestic violence, um, a law prohibiting um, so many, so many, so, um, um, what do you call it? Um, human trafficking is also prohibited. The problem is with the enforcement of the laws, you know. So the enforcement has been quite challenging. Um, some of the resources that are required to ensure that the, those who are in a position to enforce the laws should be able to do it, they are not there. If I take the case of domestic violence, for instance, um, like I said, there's a very comprehensive domestic violence legislation which prohibits um, or criminalizes domestic violence within the home, within the um, household, or within the family. The problem is one of the there are people who go through some challenges which require them to relocate from home. Mm -hmm. The state is supposed to have shelters, but that is not the case. Yeah, and that is an issue I want us to help us. We have all these laws. Within seconds, you've mentioned very, very important, uh, some of them. But if even the state is not enforcing, the individuals, if they want to enforce, I mean, push, pursue this, how easy or difficult is it? Are Ghanaians timid when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, demanding their right? Or is it too expensive uh, to, to pursue, you know, your, your, your legal right? So if even the government side we are not enforcing, can the individuals also pursue their right? And if they are, uh, do you find Ghanaians strong enough? Are they are timid, family, yami kind of people? So they will allow their right to be abused, or it's too expensive to pursue your right in this country. How how do you see this side of our life? Thank you, Reverend. In my view, it's a combination of all the things you've said. When it comes to you know the constitution, the fundamental, I mean, the constitution makes room for people to pursue their rights when they are abused. You can go to court to enforce it but enforcement comes with some use of resources. 
the state has tried to make provision through the legal aid service. I mean, now it's the Legal Aid Commission. It's just been, they've just amended the law from the Legal Aid Board scheme to the Legal Aid, um, um, I think it's Legal Aid Commission now, which is supposed to provide free legal services. The problem is that they're understaffed. If you go to most regions, they don't have enough people to help. Then there's also the problem with access to, to the courts. It's, it's itself a problem. I know that the judicial service have done well. We have courts in, some, in quite a number of, Virtually every district, every administrative district, or there may be, I, I, this is what I think, I think there are courts everywhere. Under the Local Government Act, the district assemblies are supposed to provide the courts. So in places where they've not provided it, it's not been possible, I believe, to have courts in there. So access to the courts is a problem for some people. And, but generally, I think in Ghana, we have this, as you said, Jinya Nyame issue. Sometimes society pressures people not to pursue their legal rights. I guess it's part of our, you know, social cultural um, upbringing where people would, disputes are settled at home. If it doesn't, it's not possible to settle, maybe it's taken to the chief's palace to try to settle it. And so people see, in some communities, they see the courts as um, like a foreign sort of entity. So people who do take their matters to court and pursue it, uh, discouraged, and that is one of the problems. Some of the enforcement means also requires the use of the police and some of the services. There are also challenges that people encounter there as well. So it's a, it's a combination of factors that results in people not pursuing their rights as much as they, they, they can. When it comes to issues to do with um, contribution towards maintenance of children, under our Children's Act, the law indicates that it's the two people who bring a child into the world who are primarily responsible. Sometimes if the parties are not married, invariably you find that the child will be living with the mother and then getting the father to make a contribution is a big problem. They can go to the family and juvenile courts, which are in at the district, um, um, at the, at the district court level, but from some um, meetings, well, some, some research which has been done, even the little money people are supposed to pay to access these courts is a problem. The, 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 the family tribunal system or the juvenile court system is such that you can actually go to court and file the suit yourself and pursue it. But there's lots of challenges in enforcing the court orders. You know, it's very challenging, you know. Um, I was at a recent meeting where we were looking at some of the options available to ensure that there's continued flow of support for non, um, from non-custodial parents to custodial parents in terms of um, have, I mean, the courts making orders to get the bank accounts of people, etc., or even serving orders on their employers so that monies that are required for their children's school fees, etc., is at that source. But it is very, very challenging because we also have a large um, majority of our population not in formal employment. You know, the person is... Um, by day laborer, she's a driver, you know. So we need to be thinking of innovative ways in which some of these support systems that are required to ensure that our children grow up to become responsible adults. Yeah. Maybe let's come back to the, that last point you made, the issue of that we must be innovative. Those of you who have constant interaction with the law may not have my challenges, but somebody like me, you know, yes, I have a copy of the Constitution, may or even if some may not even have a copy of the Constitution. But if I read it, I read English language, the legal implications of what I'm reading, I may not understand. And I can imagine other people in our rural communities who is educating Ghanaians when it comes to legal knowledge, not going to school to become a lawyer, but basic fundamental things. Who is doing it uh, so that I now understand, you know, who, if I want legal knowledge in, 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 in Ghana, where do I go? Okay, thank you very much, Reverend. When it comes to legal knowledge or access to the, to the information, the, 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 the legal knowledge, there are quite a number of both state institutions and private institutions that people can access. Um, the statutory institution that is responsible for educating everybody on what their rights are is the National Commission for Civic Education. And
and I think the inf I mean, information services departments also have some a, a role. Um, I think they try to do what they can, but I guess it's also not enough. And there's a need for, I know that the information service department used to have these um, what, trucks that they take around the country with little clips of film. You know, even the language in which you translate the information to people can be challenging. So there have there been ways in which people can act out various um, sort of rights issues, and then it's explained to communities, etc. So I believe these institutions are there. Then we also have SHRAJ, Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. And I must say that SHRAJ is at most districts. There are some districts where sometimes you may not even have courts functioning, but you find SHRAJ, they do a lot of mediation, and they also do some education as well. And then a lot of NGOs um, have also dedicated or you know, made it one of their programs to also go around the country to educate people on their rights. I know that FIDA Ghana, for instance, is one of them. We have WILDAF, a number of the women lawyers groups, African Women Lawyers Association, Lawa Ghana, quite a number of them. And other groups also pick on issues and then try to disseminate information. FIDA, for instance, has translated some very basic laws, the intensive succession law, etc., into a number of other languages. And when they do their advocacy, they share it around, make people, give it access, access to people. At the Ghana Bar Association itself, to, they also have a role. They have a, a women and minors committee, which I've been chairing since 2008. Every year, what we do is to um, get our members around the country to um, go to churches, go to some institutions, schools, etc., to try to educate people on their basic human rights. A few, in some of the um, curriculum for our children at the junior high school level. I think that some of their life skills programs, um, textbooks, have some information. Because I remember um, in some of the advocacy we tried to do on some laws, some of the children would tell you, oh, they learned this. We, we, we tried to go to some of the secondary schools and uh, at the JSS. They'll tell you that, oh, this one we learned it because we were taking through the intensive succession law, for instance, at the, uh, during some particular class. So I think the responsibility is on all of us to be able to disseminate the information. It could that. be better, I would say. Is the issue of legal illiteracy in Ghana something we should be worried about? I think so. I think so. I think we should be worried about it. And I think that the media should play a very big role because the media reaches people in their homes. So I think that we should be pushing more for programs on the media which will be explaining basic um, laws, basic human rights laws, basic um, laws that can help people in their day-to-day -day living. So be, I know a few people have started a few programs, but I think we need more, particularly in the vernacular um, language, so that people will learn about their rights and then know also where to go to be able to enforce it. We, we, we need it. We need it a lot. Viewers, I'm in conversation with Mrs. Sheila Minka Premo, a human rights uh, consultant, but she's a real advocate about issues about human right, women right, human dignity. And she is admitting on what is next that we need to revisit the issue of legal illiteracy in this country. Now, Mrs. Minka Pramo, Auntie Sheila, as I want to call you, when we come to the public side or public sector. The laws are there. At the workplace, you know you're right. But when you come to the private side, people's home, people's marriages, you mention religious body, sectors that you want to consider as, as private. How do you assess uh, human rights issues, human rights uh, abuses in the private side? Do we have enough laws for the private side of our, na of our national life? Well, the, the laws I mentioned are supposed to also be applicable within the, the, the private sphere as well. The problem is with how to access these laws. For instance, the Domestic Violence Act that I mentioned, for instance, indicates that, you know, people who are in, uh, you know, it applies to, if you, if you commit any acts of physical, sexual, psychological, economic violence against somebody within the home setting. So you could be married people, it will be people who have been in a former relationship before. Um, it even applies to domestic workers that we live with in our homes. And to family members, you know, in Ghana, when we are talking about their family, it includes extended family. For no time, they'll come from far away, etc., etc. So if anybody commits any 
um, acts of domestic violence against anybody even within the home setting, they have a right to go and report it in the courts. In terms of how people will get to know that these laws exist, I believe that most of us go to churches, go to mosques, we go to various faith-based places. I think that some of the messages that are given to people should include some of those rights education, you know, in churches, in, in the mosque, etc., so that people will know about their rights and then also be given information as to how to enforce these rights. I know that I know some programs because I've been part of it where people identify community leaders, queen mothers, um, some some of the male traditional authorities, etc. So also take them through certain basic laws. I've been part of a program which, which did some education for queen mothers on some of the basic rights relating to women, and then they were also given um, skills in alternative dispute resolution to enhance the skills. We all know that traditionally they had their own way in which they resolve matters, but they've been also taken through some of the modern methods. So they also help to disseminate some of this information. If somebody has a problem, there's no police station in their place, there's no courts, there's no formal institution they can go to, at least there's a queen mother or there's a chief there. So if, or, or, or even, I, I, I believe that some of the education or the equipping and sensitizing people should also include these uh, religious leaders, so that if they also have the information, then they'll be in a position to be able to direct people as to where to go. Okay. You mentioned church leaders, and we are talking about human rights abuses and how to make sure people are conscious when it comes to their right in this country. Now, I have seen on television 12, 14 year old giving testimony in the name of miracle that she is a witch and people were clapping and that she killed her mother and she killed this and we're happy in this country 14 year old saying uh, she's a witch and pastors were there there are churches today in Ghana that don't allow pregnant women to go to hospital in the name of anointing, that they are praying the anointing will take care of the mother and the baby. With all the effort, Ministry of Health and others are making to slow down our mothers who are dying at, at, at the point of delivering other human life. There are churches in Ghana who will not allow people to go to school in the name of faith. So the place where you are directing us to, why others are doing very well, do we have laws, structures to handle the abuses of uh, 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 children and women and others in the name of religion. You recall that, thank you Reverend, you recall that when I mentioned some key provisions in the fundamental human rights section of the Constitution, I mentioned Article 26, which says that customary as well as religious practices which dehumanize or injurious are prohibited. So for me, I always use the Constitution as a starting point. So that, you know, looking at Article 26, it says it is wrong and something has to be done about it. We have several provisions in the Criminal Offences Act of 1960, which criminalizes certain things. And I believe that, and then we have, um, I mean, we don't really specifically have legislation dealing with religious bodies. I know that currently there's discussion, Parliament wants us to come up, up with some provisions, but the religious groups, because I, I, I do some work also at the Christian Council, they are trying to work with the other um, faith-based organizations to see whether they can come up with self-regulation. But definitely, I think that it should be possible to report some of these abuses to relevant institutions, to the courts, you know, the Human Rights Division of the Courts, to the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, so that action can be taken against them. I believe, I, I've heard stories of people reporting a few of these things particularly to Shraj, I haven't followed up on the outcome. And I, I believe that if there's any group that is strong enough to also take some of these um, abuses of people's rights, because children have rights, children have to be protected. They shouldn't be exposed to certain things which would, would, would be of detriment to them in the future. And I think that it is about time that maybe some groups that are advocating for rights should also be prepared to, to you know, take up on some of these matters and pursue it. I don't know where we should start from. 
this evening up to tomorrow, there are TV stations in Ghana that you will find people, people, and most often women, who will be giving something to drink in, in church, who has who has examined the content, you know, and these things are in the media. This testimony children are giving. They are all over the place. I want to believe the bodies you have mentioned, all the shrug and the women lawyers and all that. Because most often, these people, uh, 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 they go there, maybe they were sick, they had challenges. So if you expect them to report, it will take us forever. How do we, how do we, where do we start? Because these abuses, Auntie Sheila, they do exist. And they are common. This evening, there are TV stations that you can start your search. Hmm. Reverend, I, 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 I totally agree with what you're saying. And as I indicated, it's about time that groups as well as institutions that have a responsibility as far as addressing abuses as concerned should take some of these matters up. You know, when it comes to issues to do with it, I mean, if people have a right to health, and if, let's say, a religious leader is... Is, is not allowing somebody to pursue their right to health. I believe that it should be possible, as you indicated, that particular woman would be in a very vulnerable situation, so it may be difficult for her to um, take it up herself. But I think that we need to get well-meaning people who will be able to collect um, credible evidence or information and use it as a basis to lodge a claim against a particular church for some of these things. I watched a clip you know, some time ago, I've forgotten which station it was, um, where they were, they, they, somebody was monitoring some group which will not allow pregnant women to um, be taken to hospital to go and even deliver and all the problems associated with it. I, I, people have, you know, apart from the laws we have in Ghana, we also have international human rights principles. You know, most of our laws are derived from um, some of these principles, including those at the United Nations level as well as those at the African Union level. I believe that it's about time that, you know, the work that we are doing, maybe as activists, we should go beyond maybe just advocacy and the policy level to actually going on the ground and helping and supporting some vulnerable people to take some of these matters up. I know it will not be easy, um, but I think that we should, I'll throw a challenge to myself and to some of us out there. I know some groups are, already trying to do things like that, but it's not easy, especially if you have a re reluctant um, complainant, you know, especially under our criminal law. Um, if you want to report an offense has occurred, usually the complainant has to be willing to come and testify, etc., etc. So th that's the big shot. When it comes to domestic violence, it's easier because the domestic violence law allows bystanders to go and make a report on behalf of a victim. So maybe it's also about time we took a look again at some of our laws to see how we can empower others around people to be able to take up some of these matters. But it still does not, even with the existing laws, groups and uh, you know groups of people, well-meaning people, can be able to, who have evidence, enough evidence about some abuse, should be able to take it up. Viewers. I'm in conversation with Mrs. Shiramen Kapremo, and today she is throwing a challenge to herself and others who are activists on women, children issue that can we go beyond advocacy and even policy matters and get down to where the people are and consider the kind of interventions that we can make. Auntie Sheila, we were at Beijing conference. We have affirmative action in our laws. You've mentioned our constitution, you've mentioned um, some even on this platform. We have signed UN conventions on discriminations that are against women. We have a whole ministry on gender social protection. Are we handling women issues properly in Ghana? Hmm. Thank you, Reverend. I think I, you know, the women issues my response to the issues to do with women is also similar to the one to do with human rights. We have some laws, but there are some gaps. And even with the existing laws, there are problems in the enforcement. 
I mean, when it comes to something like the Domestic Violence Act, one of the groups that particularly benefit from it are women, because it's been found from research which has been undertaken that most of majority, not all, majority of the victims of domestic violence are women. So there are, there are laws that address that. We have the intestate succession law, which was the law that was enacted to ensure that if someone dies intestate or without making their will, then the way in which the person's property should be distributed is guided by legislation and it protects the rights of spouses, etc. This was a law enacted in 1985. We, however, have a few gaps. I was recently part of a team that was preparing Ghana's, I mean, the Ghana's alternative report. Actually, I, I went to both meetings. I went to the government meeting, which looked at how far Ghana has come 25 years from Beijing. So the Beijing um, plus 25 report. Then I also participated in the NGU shadow report, which is still being put together, where we looked at, you know, from 1995, what has happened. And in tracing, but quite a lot has happened, as I've, I've just thrown out. A lot of legislation have come in, you know, criminalizing um, some of the particular offenses which are, were perpetrated against women, like female genital mutilation, like the um trocosis, etc., domestic violence law, etc. But we still still need some more. We still have problems with issues of affirmative action. If you look in if you look in Ghana at leadership, look at the number of ministers that we have, male against female. Look at parliament, the number of women that we have, male against female. Out of the two hundred and seventy five parliament that we have, only about thirty are women. Now here's about thirteen percent or whatever. If you look at, if you go to most of the ministries, um, look at the higher level, chief directors, etc., how many are women? So as I indicated in Article 17.4 of the 1992 Constitution says that, where it's been found that, you know, through various historical reasons, etc., cultural or whatever it is, one particular gender is, I mean, doesn't have the same numbers, you know, is, or discriminated against as against the other gender. And there's a need for legislation. So we've been trying to push for an affirmative action law, a comprehensive affirmative action law in Ghana. There are a few policies at the district assembly level when it comes to government appointees. There's just 30 to 40 percent um, that are supposed to be women when they are appointed. But when it comes to elective positions, you know, there are several reasons why very few women are seen in parliament and places like that. Because people see women's role as in the home. So when it comes to electing people into public office, it's a challenge. And then, you know, that has also, very few women also have the chance to go through education to the highest level. If some of us have reached there, but not many women. The those the literate people in this country, I think majority of them are women. So we are pushing for this legislation, which would ensure that when it comes to public, because there's research which has been done in Ghana, which shows that the numbers are not good, even as I've mentioned a few. So this legislation would ensure that, that it would be the government's responsibility to ensure we have um, we reach some kind of equity or all the way to equality. Ghana is also a member state to the Sustainable Development Goals, which has made the year 2030, the year where there should be parity. So we are hoping that this legislation will be passed. We understand that it's in cabinet now. It has gone to, it's, it's gone to parliament before, but it didn't go through the process. It's now in cabinet. We are hoping that it will be in parliament soon. We've been assured to get to parliament soon. And we, once it is put in place, special measures will be put in place. You know, we want to, to send ensure. a plea to somebody watching us on the affirmative action bill. Okay. Talk to somebody who is watching us. So we, we would send a plea to our own men, honorable minister for gender, children, and social protection to try to push this bill through cabinet to parliament. We would plead with the members of cabinet. This, this, this camera. Continue. We, we would also plead with all members of cabinet who have the, the affirmative action bill before them to treat it as a matter of urgency and to make sure that they complete their work and it's sent to parliament. And at the cabinet, we start off with the president, as well as his ministers who are there. And then when it reaches in, um, the parliament, we would also plead with the members of parliament that they should also treat this bill with some agency so that it will be enacted into law, as we have been promised. Now, when it comes to jointly owned or acquired properties, what are the challenges, especially when it comes to women? When women have jointly acquired properties with their husband, 
And if it happens, maybe somebody decided not to prepare a will. Do we have challenges now in that area of our national life? Um, as I indicated, you know, when it comes to issues of property rights, the issue arises both at death and then in case the marriage also doesn't work out at divorce as well. It's, it's a culture, it starts off with our culture. Traditionally, um, there's this old 1959 yeah, case called Hermati, where a woman who had worked with her husband on a farm, you know, and, and his businesses and some properties were acquired. And then when things didn't go well and the woman um, had to leave and she wanted a share, at that time, the court indicated that a woman's responsibility was to help her husband, a woman and her children's responsibility was to help the husband in whatever work he was doing, and whatever came out of it belonged only to the man. This was in 1959. Since then, the courts have used equitable principles to ensure that properties that you know, spouses both contribute to, a certain portion is given to the other spouse at the point of um, dissolution. And currently, the, as I indicated, when I was highlighting some key provisions in the Constitution, Article 22 of the Constitution indicates that properties which are jointly acquired should be equitably distributed. The same Article 22 also indicates that properties which are also jointly acquired by spouses, when each of them dies, the other should have a reasonable portion out of it. But this issue has been addressed as far back as 1985. You know, before 1985, the way in which properties were shared or were distributed when the person died in test states without making a will, depending on your personal law, whether you were married under customary law, under the marriage ordinance, whether you were Muslim, etc. And in each of those regimes, it was found that um, that's the female spouse was usually not considered. You know, in the matrilineal setting, children would benefit, um, male children would benefit from landed properties, male ch female children were not, spouses were not part. In the matrilineal setting, the wafase, that is the nephew or niece, would inherit the spouse. If you don't marry the nephew, then you are out. The children also subject to good behavior, etc. So in 1985, it was realized that our society was changing. People were living more and more in the nuclear type um, family and helping each other in acquiring in properties. Meanwhile, um, people were suffering when their spouses died. So the 1985, the Intestate Succession Act, uh, well, at that time it was called uh, the Intestate Succession Law, PNDC Law 111, was enacted to ensure that if a person died intestate, a sizable portion of a person's, um, that person's property goes to the surviving spouse and children, mm. with a little going to the, the wider family. That law has been in place since 1985. There have been a few challenges with it, so some have been documented. And there's also a bill to try to address some of the provisions in it to strengthen it, particularly the part to do with jointly acquired property. Mm. So that if there's jointly acquired property, there's a need for it to be reflected in the, um, the, the, the new legislation so that spouses will get a bigger share out of, I mean, they are, they are shared out of jointly acquired property before it's also shared. That has it's also been in Parliament. Mm. It's gone to Parliament together. There was another law called the Property Rights of Spouses Bill, which was supposed to then address issues to do with property at divorce. The, these two bills went to Parliament in 2008, then elapsed because it was um, election in 2009. It again went to Parliament in October. Um, it went up and down Parliament, and then it's also, um, it didn't get passed. And then it also lapsed again. In 2013, the two bills also went back to Parliament. They were also not passed. Currently, the Intestate Succession Bill is before Parliament, but the Property Rights Responses Bill has not found its way back hmm. in there. But as far as wills, I think you, you specifically, I just wanted to explain, give a little bit of background. As far as wills is concerned, we have the Wills Act of 1971, Act 360, which indicates the processes a person should use to make a will. That is, you make a will f with your self-acquired properties that you've acquired yourself. You can indicate how you share it. But uh, there's a provision in the Wills Act which says that if you have a dependent spouse and children, then it should make provision for them. And if you don't, then that person can, when you pass away, can go to court mm -hmm. for provision to be made out of your property for them. Mm. Now, is will preparation something you talk about in a very good day? Oh, we do. I, well, over the years, almost every year or so. In a very happy mm. moment, then you start talking about preparing. Because for us, the moment you talk about preparation of will, it's like, you know, you're about to leave. Okay. 
it's also based on our culture. You know, our cultural practices sort of informs how we perceive certain things. Traditionally, among the accounts, you have something we call samansil. Mm -hmm. The accounts have a, is a samansil, where when a person is at the point of death, then they will call, you know, principal members of the family, head of the family, etc., and then indicate that when I die, this and this should go to this person. And usually the person will die shortly afterwards. And some of these matters too have gone to court and, you know, there's been a lot of interpretation right to it. So the will making, which is where you can make the will, and, you know, which is a totally different kind of thing. You can make, this time, whatever instructions you want can be done, it is written down, and then it is filed. A copy is put in the safe in a, a court. It only comes into effect when you die. So people can write wills 20, 30 years, etc., before they die, and then it can be brought in there. But people still equate the samansil with the formal will making, but they are two different things. So we try to go out of our way to talk to people in churches, etc., and try to encourage people. I believe that you know we work hard to get our properties, and therefore we should have a right to decide who it should go to. You know, provided, as I've indicated, if you, if you have a dependent spouse, because there's some, there's some people who would say, wife, don't work, just cook for me. Okay, now, maybe the person may even be skilled. I will not be allowed to work. Totally depends on the person. And then the person leaves you with nothing. That is not fair. So in that case, like I said, there's provision for that person to go to court to the thing. So the will making and our old type samansu are two different things. The fact that you make a will so doesn't now, mean when people are excited, happy mood, oh, yes. they should still be when you're young. So does I think young I people, my, you know, know. When I finished school and I started working, I didn't have much, you know, just a few ch chattels. But I, did, I, I made a will. I thought that I should set a good example. Mm. So that when I go to churches and schools, I mean, to places to encourage people to write wills. And because you're a lawyer. But it's... <laughs> Can you talk to a young man who has started business looking for, you know, how do I expand my business? And somebody say, have you prepared a will? i sure people want to hear this kind of question. Oh, but when you explain to people the, 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 the need, the rationale, People understand. You know, sometimes in wills, especially when you're young, you're working, you have young children, you're married, you have little children, you want to make sure that they are well taken care of. People, even in wills, take the opportunity to prepare trusts where some property is invested, the money is used to pay children's fees, etc. So normally we take our time to explain the importance of making a will. Yes, the default situation is if you don't have a will, then the intestate succession law comes in. But um, I think that if you have a will, then you decide, because you acquired the property. In the intestate succession law, the state has decided the fractions in which the properties are supposed to be shared. Okay? For instance, if a person dies with a, with a spouse, with children, with parents living, the law says that you take out one house, you take out all household chattels who belong to surviving spouse and children, the remaining that of the property is divided into 16 parts. Out of that 16 parts, surviving children will get 9 over 16, surviving spouse 3 over 16, um, then the, the remaining um, 4 will be shared by his parent. The fr when you talk about the fractions, it's easy, but actualizing it sometimes can be very difficult mm -hmm. and can bring a lot of confusion. But in a will, you know, and then the other problem which also makes um, the intestate succession law difficult to apply is that we have polygamy in Ghana. In Ghana, out of the three different types of marriages that we have, we have three different types of marriage, which is the customary marriage, which is, we call it potentially polygamous. We have um, the, the Islamic one. Currently, we have what we call the Marriages Act of um, 1884 to 1985, which has brought all the three different ones together. So we have part one, we have part two, and part three. Part one deals with customary law. Part um, two deals with the Islamic, the, Mus the marriage of Mohammedans um, law. Then we have the Christian and other marriages. The one that used to be known as the ordinance marriage. Now they have been consolidated since 2010. And as I said, in all these three, two are potentially polygamous. The Islamic law allows a Muslim to marry and register up to four women. Customary law, there's no limit to the number of women a man can marry. It's only the ordinance marriage, which is one man, one wife. So if you look at the intestate succession law, on the face of it, it says surviving spouse and, and children, you know, you take this portion, you divide this into this fraction. If the person, if a man, has four or five wives, how do you mm -hmm. do the sharing to ensure there's equity? You know, even between the man and the woman, as well as among the multiple wives who came at different times in the person's life. There's a first wife who came in earlier, etc. 
So laws are being drafted to try to ensure that there's equity between the, the parties themselves. Auntie Sheila, when I go to our rural communities, women dominate when it comes to farming, agriculture. That you can also have this impression that these women who are into agriculture, many of them are poor. When it comes to land and land acquisition, where are women and, and the disadvantage? That they will be in the farm. Women are farming everywhere. But coming to the top has not been easy. This is something I was ever, I don't know yeah. uh, your own uh, observation yeah. in this A area. lot of research has been done. I'm sure you heard over the years, over the last few years, there was a land administration project that was undertaken by the government of Ghana. And a lot of studies were undertaken into this area. The problem is that many women that you see, particularly at the community level, hold land through, you know, not directly, they don't own most of the lands that they work on. They hold it through someone. So a person, I mean, a person may, may have the right to work on land, maybe her father's land or whatever. You know, before, okay, so before 1985, right, when women were not allowed to, um, women didn't get the rights to inherit in the same way as men. So let's take a patrilineal community. Whilst her father is alive, she can work in the farm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, when this particular, when the father dies and the land is being shared, the among the um, patrilineal communities, they said that if you give a woman ownership of land, if she marries, she take it away. So her brothers will get the land. She can work on it a bit, but when she marries, she's supposed to go and work on her husband's family land. Okay? So over there too, she won't have full ownership. She will work on it so long as the marriage goes on, etc., etc. The understanding was that with intestate succession law in place, women should be able to own, you know, at least through inheritance, etc., etc. Nothing stops a woman to, from buying land if she has the money or leasing land. But a lot of women, as you said, you know, at the, at, the, at the rural level, do not have these problems. So they own the properties through inheritance, through whatever, and then there were challenges there. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the existing research shows that um, because they hold land through either their fathers, their brothers, or their husbands, etc., when the relationships are not there anymore, etc., it is, that kind you of know. When we go to court, would you want judges to give different sentences to women? I believe that wrong is wrong and therefore if the law says that if you commit this offense then you have those punishments it can it should apply irrespective exceptions could be made for maybe pregnant women so because pregnant not, women should be sentenced differently well <laughs> your last uh, word for my viewers so, <laughs> I'm that, no, so when it comes to wrongdoing like i said wrong yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Wrong is wrong. And whatever okay. punishment it is, yes. you know, everybody but should. But pregnant be. women For should. For instance, if, let's say, the particular offense you've committed, it comes with hard labor, and the woman is pregnant, would you expect her to go and do the same hard labor that a man would we'll do? We'll talk about this another time. Please, your last words to my viewers. So my last word is that we have a lot of human rights provisions in this country, lots of laws and um, provisions out there that we can use to protect ourselves and to pursue our rights when they are abused. You should try as much as possible to learn about it as much as you can and to try to identify institutions that you can go to to enforce these rights that you have when your rights are violated. Do not sit down and suffer. There's, there are many things out there that can help you. So reach out for help. In whatever community you live in, at least you may have Shraj nearby. Go and see them for help and reach out as much as you can. Viewers, this is where time will allow us. This is what is next. I've been in conversation with Mrs. Sheila Minka Premo, managing consultant of the APES uh, uh, law uh, uh, firm. And she's a human rights consultant. She's been wonderful, sharing some very, very important insight with us. This is GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. We'll come your way, God willing, next week. Let's keep human rights and human dignity issues as very core, very important part of our nation, Ghana. God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make this country great and strong. Auntie Sheila, we are grateful. 
Thank you very much.